Hello, everybody, and welcome to Backstage Gaming, dramatic takes on your favorite games. I'm Chris. I'm Dylan. And we're here to talk about games and storytelling and how all that stuff works. And I, Dylan, I have to share with you. Okay. <laughs> this is, I swear to God, a real thought that went through my head this morning as I was making breakfast. I was thinking okay. about. I was thinking about uh, the episode. I was thinking about recording today. I was like, man, we've been doing this for a minute. We're on episode 33. And my next thought was... Man, we're going to need to come up with something to do for episode 69. <laughs> <laughs> uh, damn. Peek the mic. It's okay. I was not expecting that nonsense. <laughs> because we're like almost halfway there. And boy, howdy, we got to make that episode a special one because it's the funny sex number. <laughs> Hi, mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they've probably done it. Ah! <laughs> uh, stop! <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to cut that or not. We might leave it this in. I might cut it. This is the last episode, Chris. You and I are done. You know <laughs> this is the final episode of Backstage Gaming. Thank you for tuning in. We're never um, going to make it to that episode. <laughs> man, just think if we made it to 420. Oh, oh lord. Oh, maybe, now we have to. <laughs> you know, maybe it cannabis been will, be, will be decriminalized by then. Hey, there we go. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway, welcome to the show. Uh, that's all. I, I had to get that out because it's been haunting me for about two hours now and I needed to share it with somebody. What, my parents um, 69ing? <laughs> not that! But well, it's gonna haunt me now! Yeah, you're welcome. Um, oh, enjoy sleeping. <laughs> I won't, ever again. <laughs> um... We talk about video games on this show. Yeah, boy, howdy. Uh, if you couldn't tell already, this is a morning record, which means we nasty. <laughs> but this week, we are going to talk about what I wrote down in the episode docket was flashbulb games. In, in case this is not a term you've come across before, a flashbulb moment is one of those moments where, like, everyone knows exactly where they were when they heard about it. For just to pull an example out, my dad thought, my dad to this day remembers thinking that his second grade teacher killed John F. Kennedy because his second grade teacher happened to be out sick the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated. So, you know, there's that. Uh, <laughs> That's fucking amazing. <laughs> I love it. But we're going to be talking about uh, our personal flashbulb games. These are games that we remember having an impact on the way that we look at video games and how we look at how video games tell their stories or engage with us. Uh, it's going to be a lot more sort of like a personal list than a lot of our episodes are, but we're still going to use that as a springboard to talk about what it was that those games did and how those games created that feeling and made us remember them in that way. Episode um, 33 is going to be our origin story. <laughs> there we go. We fi we're finally getting to our backstory <laughs> after... <laughs> What, the equivalent of, like, three full television seasons? You've all been waiting so patiently. <laughs> yeah. Now we're going to really dive into the meat of what makes us us. Oh, God. Um, I'd so, like to think I'm more than just video games. I mean, I would too, but <laughs> sometimes I'm unsure. P particularly when we're recording this fucking show. What's up, uh, gamers? <laughs> it's your boy. It's Chibani. So... We're going to kind of go back and forth. We each picked a, f a handful of games. And Dylan, I th you asked before we started recording if you wanted to do uh, backwards or forwards in time. I think let's go back in time. I think okay. that sounds fun. Yeah, we'll yeah. Rewind the clock a little bit and get down, to the, get down into the nitty gritty of our childhood traumas. Would you like to go first or would you like me to take the lead? You take the lead because I'm, I'm now going back and forth on what I want my first game to be. So okay. go ahead. Uh, my first one is going to be... It's less an entire game, and it's more a particular moment in a game. I, back when they, they were first coming onto the scene, I played the original trilogy of Mass Effect games. Mm -hmm. And the Mass Effect games, I have a soft spot for them because I think that they were trying to do a lot of very interesting things. They definitely stumbled in a few places. For those of you who are unfamiliar or who never played them, the Mass Effect games, they're like a sci-fi space opera RPG developed by BioWare. And their big selling point, like the big thing about them that kind of set them apart when they were first coming out, was 
they were one of the first games to be like, all your choices have consequences. And by and large, they managed to deliver on that pretty well. Uh, Not flawlessly. There were a few instances, like famously, the ending of Mass Effect 3 got a lot of flack because it basically came down to like what ending you got came down to the final choice you make, which rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. It never bothered me as much because while that's on the bad side, there was also a lot of very cool stuff where like not only would decisions you made in, for example, at the beginning of Mass Effect 1 come back to haunt you or have repercussions later at the end of Mass Effect 1, but there were decisions that were made in Mass Effect 1 that could become relevant in Mass Effect 3 because it would like look at your save file for the previous games if you had one. Mm-hmm. And they did enough with that that the somewhat lackluster ending never really bugged me personally that much. Mm. It it got a passing grade from what I from what it sounds like. Yeah, like it it could have been better, but I was on board with all of the stuff that came beforehand enough that that was not a deal breaker for me in the way that it seemed to be for a lot of other Mass Effect fans uh, when this first came out. Mm. But specifically, I'm the Mass Effect games as a whole are not a flashbulb series for me. I thought they were cool. I really enjoyed them. Mm-hmm. There's one moment. So in Mass Effect 2, there is a party member you get who is a member of an alien race called Krogans, uh, which are like these big hulking... Think battle toads on steroids. Um, big frog-looking <laughs> dudes in power armor. And in Mass Effect 2, you get an ally who is a Krogan named Grunt. And Grunt is a genetically engineered Krogan super soldier, essentially. He's Captain Frog Boy. He's your, he's your party member through Mass Effect 2. And in Mass Effect 3, if you import a save file from Mass Effect 2 and Grunt did not die... Uh, because it's possible in all of these games for party members to die, and if they die, they're gone for good. If Grunt does not die, then there's a mission you run across where you run into Grunt, and Grunt is, like, leading a commando squad of Krogans on this mission, and you need to, like, come in and rescue the squad because they got in over their heads. And okay. Yeah, so already, cool little moment of, like, callback, a character that I really liked in Mass Effect 2 coming back at, for a cameo appearance, and I was on board for that. And the mission involves, like, you're fighting your way through this hive of robo-insects. And at the end of the mission, you, like, when you finally fight your way out, there's a cutscene in which, like, the way is blocked and you, you're you gonna get surrounded. And Grunt yells something like, GO! And then just, like, turns and charges into the, the oncoming swarm of robo-insects. And there's a, a brief cutscene of him, like kicking butt and, you know, Commander Shepard, the player character, looking over their shoulder uh, before running out of the cave. And then it fades to black, comes back up, Shepard and the gang are, like, panting on the ledge outside of the hive, uh, getting ready to get back into their shuttle. And, like, it's kind of somber. And then, right as they're about to get back on the the shuttle, you just see Grunt coated head-to-toe in, like, blue ichor, stagger out of the cave, say something like, anybody got a drink, and stumble <laughs> into, like, Shepard's arms. And I I kid you not, but I just remember, like, literally jumping off the couch and fist pumping. Yeah! Because, <laughs> like, it was a really well-done story moment. That was great. But it was also just one of the first moments in Mass Effect 3 and the Mass Effect series where I felt like they really nailed the payoff for this idea of, like, multiple games of build-up for these characters. Yeah. And that's something that, like, not a lot of games have ever done. And I think is a an underserved area. And I think that it's something, like, for all of the Mass Effect series' flaws and for all of the things about Mass Effect 3 that were disappointing, mm-hmm. which is fair, it still provided some really cool moments. And it did some really cool things with this idea of, like, storytelling and interactive medium that I think deserves like to this day still deserves praise because like I said there's not been a lot of other games that have tried to do that and succeeded in the same way Mm. I don't know that was that's my first one like I said not like the game series as a whole but like that moment I just like I get it like it's been eight years and I'm still thinking about that shit (laughs) (laughs) it's a it's a good moment I'm having a lot of trouble deciding what my first uh one's going to be um, just so you are aware, I'm flipping, flip-flopping between Final Fantasy IV mm-hmm. for the, 
uh, specifically the Game Boy Advance version of Final Fantasy IV and the first Fire Emblem game to reach America. Ooh, both very good. Yeah, so that's I, I'm going to go with Final Fantasy IV. Though. All right. So I think that game came out when I was... Yeah, I, I must have been like 11 or 12 when it came out. I think I was in sixth grade. And it was... It's the second. It was the second Final Fantasy game I played, so I was already kind of familiar with the series. Um, and moreover, I think uh, you know Final Fantasy X had a lot more like character interaction and stuff. But uh, the cool thing about Final Fantasy IV, and I feel like I've talked about it on the show previously, is that you are locked to the main character's perspective, and there's no real like formal like party selection. So uh, party members will enter your and leave your party as the story dictates. So because of that, there's really like kind of this you're you're forced to identify with like the main character in a way that like I don't think a lot of games do because you are you are so restricted to his one perspective. And on top of that, with some of the characters, their character arcs they they gain new abilities as a result of their character arcs, which is something Fucking good. I had never seen before in a game. Uh, I like, love that. Yeah, so the main character, Cecil, uh, I've talked about this before. He he was, every Final Fantasy game is kind of like a Star Wars-esque story. And in Final Fantasy IV's case, you start as actually like a Darth Vader equivalent. You're, you're the head of like an elite Imperial squadron. And you will unwittingly uh, carry out a mission in which a town burns and you orphan a little girl. And so that's kind of when <laughs> like you... Like you do. It, like you do. And so you, you renounce your uh, your position and status and you, you rescue the girl from the burning village and you decide, like, all right, I'm going to have to start a rebellion because this, this shit can't fly. Yeah. Having not played Final Fantasy IV... Do you, does that little girl remain, like, a focus of the story, or is that just inciting incident and then, like... Yes and no. It's it's always focused on Cecil, but I'll... Mm -hmm. I'll I, I yeah, was actually going continue to... Continue yeah. on. <laughs> and so there's there's a lot of little cool moments. Um, Part of the reason why I wanted to mention uh, Fire Emblem was because of the class-changing mechanic, but in Final Fantasy IV, there is a moment where you've, you've been slowly gaining a party, you're about to go and charge... You're about to go and charge the, uh, you know, the Imperial Capital to rescue your girlfriend and blah, 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 yada, yada. And then your ship gets capsized by a Leviathan. <laughs> Leviathan, the god <laughs> of the sea or whatever. You and know, like you do. Like you do. And so you get washed ashore and you are alone and your entire party has gone. And you're at one of a village that you, you sacked earlier. <laughs> so all of the... All of the villagers there, like, if they don't say, like, negative things to you, like, you can go to a bar and, like, they will poison your drink. Holy and, like, shit. you will actually have the poison status effect. Holy uh, shit. There's another NPC you can talk to who will turn you into a pig. And so you feel really vulnerable and it's a really cool moment. And I uh, love eventually that. you talk to the village leader and he's like, the only way you can repent is if, if you climb to the top of Mount Ordeals. And the light at the top judges you. And so naturally... What does that mean? <laughs> and so uh, he sends two mages to accompany you there. They're, they're two children. And they're, they're both mages, though. And so you climb to the top of this mountain. And you are in this little chamber. And uh, there's this light that talks to you. Um, and you, are, you, you become a paladin. Like, he turns you into a paladin, but you have to fight a boss fight against your shadow doppelganger. So before you turn into a paladin, you are a Dark Knight wearing this Darth Vader-esque armor. Um, and so the only way to win that fight is if you don't attack the, the Dark Knight reflection of yourself, because it uses an attack that, like, actively hurts itself. So you just kind of gotta let it wear itself out while, like, just focusing and healing on yourself. That's so cool. It's it's a really great moment, and Damn, Final Fantasy IV is filled with story beats like that. Why don't more games... Oh, that that gave me, like, heavy Paper Mario vibes, mm -hmm. but I can't think of, like, a specific ex moment like, that is why. <laughs> but, like, dang, that's that's dope. I love that. 
Mm-hmm. And like I, I I mentioned the girl because like she she kind of slipped to the wa- the wayside, but um she the reason why her village was destroyed was because she was a summoner. She has the ability to summon these creatures called idolins, and Leviathan is an idolin. So when he attacked the ship, he was actually rescuing the girl from you, and he takes her back to his like realm, and she. The realm almost acts like a hyperbolic time chamber from Dragon Ball Z, and so she's Good. actually she's like actively learning more magic and like more spells and stuff. Um, and so like I think roughly thirteen years pass for her. So <laughs> she comes back to help you at like a plot critical moment, and she's this badass black mage summoner. And it's like the fuck it's, yeah, the, like Final Fantasy IV is just filled with like these cool little character moments where it's like I I was having this character arc off screen. And now I'm back and rejuvenated, and I can help you. And, and it's, lo- it's it's really uh, yeah. Blah, blah. Go ahead. <laughs> and, and I love that how much that they bake that into the mechanics of like what you're actually doing, like the the fight against the mirror version of yourself. You're you're Darth Vader in the cave. Mm-hmm. You're becoming a paladin. You're becoming a less violent sort of character. How do you do it? Well, you focus on healing yourself and not attacking this thing as it as its own rage wears it down. That's really cool. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people knock Final Fantasy IV because the third act gets a little outlandish. But, like, I don't care because, like, the character stuff is so consistent that, like, it kind of makes up for the fact that the story gets a little off the rails because it was a Super Nintendo game. <laughs> and as we all know about the Super Nintendo, they nasty. <laughs> No, that's really cool. I'm going to have to find a copy of that game somewhere. It is on Steam, although, fair warning, the uh, Steam version is based off of the DS version, which is much harder. Oh, well, uh, I'm like, okay with that. All right, I'll tag back in. Let, okay, me add him, yeah. let, let me add him, Coach. The next one I'm going to talk about is a game that I've I've spoken about at least a couple times before on the show, but never never in a ton of detail. Um, okay. One of the games that has had like the most lasting impact on me. Oh, I think I know what this is. Continue. <laughs> uh, well, we'll see if you're right. It's a li- little game, little lesser-known gem of the late 90s, early 3D era of PC gaming, Thief yep. the Dark Project. Yep, all right. There we good. are. <laughs> yeah, you know. This game is so good. If you have not played Thief, it's on Steam. Go play Thief. It might not be your cup of tea, but... I dug what I played. I just need to play more of it. Yeah. So Thief the Dark Project is a first-person stealth game in which you are a thief and you you, most of the missions revolve around there is something expensive in that place you're not supposed to be so get in there without being seen get the expensive thing and get out and this is going to be tapping into a little bit of what we talked about last week when we were talking about that idea of mundane fantasy thief the dark project is not a mundane fantasy game but it's one of the first games i ever played that felt like a living world that I was just Mm -hmm. interacting with because it's a stealth game. And so it's all about like figuring out, like watching the guards as they patrol and figuring out like when they're going to have their back turned and keeping them, keeping in mind that like you have to close the doors behind you because if you leave them open and they weren't open the last time a guard saw him, they're going to think something's up. And like, it's basically like a big puzzle box of, different mechanics like how visible you are and how audible you are and you have all of these different tools that you can use to interact with that like as the game goes on uh your primary weapon or tool in the game is you have a bow with a big quiver full of different arrows and so you can get like water arrows that you can use to douse torches or you can get moss arrows that you can shoot at areas of hard floor to make them quieter and it's all about like puzzling your way through these worlds that feel very real Mm -hmm. occasionally a wrench will get thrown into that such as one time when because it was still the early days of 3d gaming and you know budgets and memory space was not what it is today uh i put out a torch with a water arrow this was noticed by a guard who then spent about 90 seconds wandering around the area going something's up in here and then when his ai reset he went yeah must have been a rat and i lost my shit (laughs) but it's a really interesting example of a very early attempt at the kind of like reactive sandbox experiences that we get now yeah 
the one other thing about it that I absolutely love, and this will, you know, given what I said about how much I like the, like, weird little notes and, like, maps of where the guards are going to be in Assassin's Creed 1, like I talked about last week, this should not be a surprise. The map in Thief of the Dark Project is my favorite because you don't get a mini-map. You don't get a level map. You get, like, a floor plan. You are given, like... This is what the house looks like on the inside, and here's what the hallways and rooms are, but it never tells you where you are in it. It just gives you a floor plan and says, figure it out. And sometimes it doesn't even give you that much. There's a, there's a level where you go into, like, this haunted mine, and all you get is, there are seven floors. Figure it out. <laughs> and I fucking love it. I love, again, it's a little thing, but it goes a long way to making that world feel like a real place that I am interacting with and that you're having mm -hmm. to riddle your way through like the character that you're playing as would and it really helps it to be like for how old it is especially an incredibly immersive game and mm -hmm. one that i frequently go back and play snippets of just because i like want to be in that world again i uh out of curiosity i was looking up uh looking glass studios the uh mm -hmm. company behind the thief games they didn't make a ton else yeah, well, I'm actually surprised because I didn't realize they made syst the System Shock games yep. and uh, the Ultima Underworld uh, 3D dungeon crawlers. Yep. And that's and really cool. <laughs> the uh, one or two of the lead designers from Looking Glass went on to be uh, some of the head creatives behind this, the Dishonored games. Yeah, yeah. Uh, along with a couple people who worked on... Uh, the Half-Life games. Shit, I need to find the time to play Dishonored 2. I I have not had very much time for it either. I have it on my hard drive and I really need to get into it because yeah. what I've played of it is great. <laughs> oh, this is like a small tangent, but again, going with this theme of chris like stealth games, uh, Dishonored 2 has a great feature where you can choose just not to get any of the weird like supernatural powers. Oh, wow. You can choose to say, nah, I don't need your help warlock daddy and instead <laughs> just play it like it's a thief game and i fucking love it <laughs> that, that makes me so happy anyway that's that's thief everyone go like if anything i just said sounds interesting thief is like ten dollars on steam if that much and it's worth <laughs> every goddamn penny i'm um, hearing you talk about some of the stuff uh in i almost said thief underworld world but uh really reminds me of uh my time playing breath of the wild like, yep. obviously not one-to-one, -one, but, like, just kind of playing with the... It's, it's like, all of the mechanics and the physics are, like, a clock, and you can just... Like, it's like clockwork, and you can do things to manipulate. Yep, 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 yep. it's yep. completely self-sustained, and that's really cool. I really I dig it. it. I really... Like, games like that have always... I mean, and we, we just did a whole episode talking about this, but, like, things like that, things like uh, what I've played of Majora's Mask, and, like, the routine mm. aspect of that... Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I dig game designers that build in those kinds of systems. Mm -hmm. um, before we hop to your next one, Dylan, how do you feel uh, about heading to the theater and uh, taking a look in the playbill for the day? That's a, that's a good idea. I like it a lot. Someday maybe there will be ads in there that pay us. Who knows? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> So hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Playbill. We hope you enjoy reading this with your ears. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Happy morning, Cass. I talk for a living. Um, <laughs> so we're going to talk about some other stuff that we're doing and some other stuff that we think you should check out. And to start with, Dylan, uh, I have been very, very curious about retro anime recently uh i've been i've been hankering to rewatch some gunbuster and that's gotten me in sort mm -hmm. of a gynax mood and that's been making me think of other old mecha anime do you know anything about mecha anime and or podcasts related to that uh neon genesis evangelion's on netflix but why would you watch that when you can listen to <laughs> uh you can you can listen smooth to... and topical hey uh you can listen to uh a podcast that i'm doing with our mutual friend gentleman and scholar coop uh we are doing dude you remember macross that is d-u-d-e do you remember m-a-c-r-o-s-s -S. and that is basically a sh uh, a show where we look at early 1980s sci-fi anime uh macross uh, super dimensional fortress macross and we we talk about a lot of the themes a lot of the potential historical context 
Um, like I said last week, I'm actually reading an old book about, like, Japan's, like, war time mentality and, like, how learning how to move beyond that. And so that is informing my read of this mecha anime. And there's there's a lot of really cool stuff that we talk about or consider about that we, we have seen in this show. So I really like it. I'm really proud of the stuff we do there, as I am here. And I think if you would like to check that out... You can uh, find us on anchor.fm slash dude, you remember again, D U D E. Uh, we are also on twitter.com at dude, you remember. And we are also on Spotify, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. Oh, yeah. You should also go and show some love to our friends over at The Unexplored Places. They are an actual play podcast hosted by our friend Christine, and they are great. Uh, they are. Recently wrapped up season one, they're going to be doing a couple of interstitial episodes in the near future and then heading into season two, which is going to feature the vocal and performing talents of both Dylan and myself. And we're so fucking excited to be part of it. It's going to be a great time. You'll get to hear me doing some very goofy voice work because I'm the insufferable prick who's like, yeah, I'm going to do a character voice even though no one else Always. does. Um, Always. Oh yeah, but it's going to be great. It's going to be a really fun new campaign in a new game system, and you should totally world. go whole whole new world we live in. Um, <laughs> and you should go oh and <laughs> you should go that's, check that's out. That's actually a neat transition into the next game. Continue. Yeah, uh, you should you should go and check out the uh, their whole backlog of season one. It's a fantastic season. They do some really cool stuff. Uh, and give them some love. You can find them on Twitter at unexploredcast or at unexploredcast.libsyn.com, and you should totally check them out. I should also encourage everyone to go and check out my current favorite audio drama podcast that's being released, Unwell, a Midwestern Gothic mystery. It's a super fun, spooky, scary story set in the rural Midwest, so it feels very near and dear to my heart. Uh, it's fantastic. The sound design has been incredible. The performances are all incredible. Uh, and this week, they're putting out episode 11, which features me in the background, and then the next episode they put out, episode 12, features me in, like, the coda to the first season, and I'm really proud of getting to be a part of what is, like, a really incredible show, and you should all go and give them a listen. You can find them wherever you get your podcast. They're also on Twitter, at Unwell Podcast. We have a Patreon. Our yes, Patreon we do helps us because it means that neither of us have to pay anything out of pocket to support the running of the show with our things like our hosting fees, our web domain. Uh, that is all supported by you, the fans, and that's incredible and humbling, and we're so, so glad for that. Uh, if you are not currently a patron, if this is something you like, if you want to show your support for us, a couple of dweebs making a podcast, that would mean the world to us, and you can do that by heading to patreon.com slash bsgpod we've got a discord server for our patrons where people just sort of hang out and chat about what they're playing what they're watching and we've got different rewards like blooper reels that i'm i swear i'm getting one up this week and then the rest oh, we of them are, are come that's shortly. exciting i'm trying i'm trying I can't real wait, hard can't wait to relive those memories <laughs> <laughs> but we've got a bunch of different stuff like that and if you choose to support us in that way just know that you are helping us to make the show even better and to be able to devote even more time to this show and even more resources to this show and potentially even to get started on some other shows that we have ideas for. So if you want to do that, if you like what we're doing enough to want to fungibly support us, patreon.com slash bsgpod. And to everyone who's already a patron, thank you so much. Like it, it's honestly like really, really cool that we've gotten even to just the point of not losing money on this show anymore. Uh, so thank you so much for that. And now let's get right back into uh, this very uh self-indulgent episode that we're doing here dylan what's your next uh what's your next flashbulb game pokemon gold mm. it's a whole new world we live in mm, yum 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 yummy yummy uh i talked about a lot of the reasons why this game is special to me uh last week so i will try to breeze past that but basically there 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 is an internal game clock that counts the time like super accurately in addition to the actual day of the week it is um, and so you have different events that happen at different days, um, at different times. Uh, there are radio shows you can tune into. <sighs> Man, I really, I really don't want to dwell on this too long, but I think I, it, it does need the mention. So it, it, it was really cool to me because I remember 
when I played Pokemon Gold, I think I was like seven. That feels about right. Two thousand one, <laughs> right? I oh, I I was like, yeah, yeah, I was seven. And so, yet when I was seven, I was like, this is incredible. It's like there's a whole world in my pocket right now. <laughs> um, and just like this this idea of like this freedom. The the long and short of it is that like turning that game on and playing for a couple hours felt like I was going on a vacation in my own home or at summer camp or wherever it is that I turned it on. And yeah, I don't want to I don't want to dwell on that one too much. So I'll I'll just kind of that's that's the that's the freebie. Yeah, I mean the the Pokemon games have always been really fun. Gold and Silver were definitely my favorites as well for a lot of that same reason. Just like I think that those games really hit the magic of the exploration aspect of that game mm -hmm. in a really perfect way. Uh, but like you said, we talked a lot about that last week, so there's no need to like go super deep on it currently. Yeah, I thought about saying Ocarina of Time, but like honestly, a lot of the things I love about Ocarina of Time, I played Pokemon Gold first, and so right. All right, we're getting back. Now we're, we're going to go as far back as I can think of a game that like actually had a lasting impact on me. Yep, exciting. And this is not to say that they're like my earliest gaming memories are things like playing Duck Hunt with my older brother on his NES and things playing like that. Playing what now? Duck Hunt. <laughs> Duck Hunt. There we go. <laughs> that, that's, I have to channel my inner Smash Bros announcer who was so careful. <laughs> Duck Hunt. Um <laughs> It's incredible. There are games that I, like, gaming memories I have from before this, but my earliest moment of, like, oh, crap, I didn't know you could do that in a game is uh, the seminal classic of the LucasArts point-and-click adventure gaming era. Ah, uh, yes. Grim Fandango. Classic. Um, Grim Fandango is incredible. I, we have in our episode docket, someday we're going to do an episode on conversation as a core gameplay mechanic because there's a lot of games that have done really interesting things with that grim fandango is definitely one of them and so we'll probably get more in the weeds on that when we do that episode but grim fandango is like maybe the single most well-told game story i've ever played it's definitely up there part of that is it's a point and click adventure game so they're basically all story and you know things like the monkey island series were pretty up there too but grim fandango the basic plot is that you play as Manny Calavera, a Grim Reaper, which in this fiction means that you're basically a travel agent. You <laughs> collect the souls of the dead and sell you them. You offer different packages for yeah, travel. Travel through travel the packages. afterlife to their eternal reward. And you can take you're a doing this. Or a train, or like if you if you don't have enough virtue saved up from your life, yep. you get like a walking stick. It's fucking great. Uh <laughs> And Manny, Manny Calavera is doing this as basically his purgatory. Like, this is his penance for his own transgressions in life. But you play as Manny as he attempts to get himself to his eternal reward. And it's... The world is beautiful. It's really uh, influenced stylistically by the uh, traditional decorations and, uh, like festivities of the mexican day of the dead celebration mm -hmm. so like all of the characters they're skeletons but like very stylized and very reminiscent of like the ornamental skulls that you'll see at day of the dead festivities yeah um also uh very casablanca-esque oh yeah uh like scenery and music it's like it's if you take casablanca or like that sort of era of pseudo-noir romanticized Hollywood and feed it through a Day of the Dead filter. You get the aesthetic, which is, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful, colorful, like, really immediately recognizable game. But it's also full of all these moments of, like, really profound character growth for Manny and the people that he interacts with. It sometimes is a little bit dumb because it's a point-and-click adventure game, so, like, you'll run into moments of, like, oh, how do you solve this puzzle where you get, well, you get this fire hydrant uh, from this friendly clown, and then you hand that off to the fire department, and they will give you a length of rope that you use to climb into that window and get that cat to give to that old lady who will give you a fern who you that you use to tickle the guy that's in your way. Uh... <laughs> It's yeah no it uh <laughs> so like here's the deal did you ever beat that game as a kid I, oh did yeah you, did you use a guide oh yeah 
Okay, okay. And I have I no shame say, in admitting that. Okay, I was about like, to say, like, I, would I always, tried playing that game without a guide, and I was like... <sighs> I would always try to do it without a guide, and I could do a lot of it without a guide, but, like, I have no shame about having used a guide, because the puzzles are not the point. The point is the story. And yeah. the story is beautiful. Like, what I love is every... It's divided up into three chapters. And every chapter ends with Manny ending up on, like, the next stage of his journey at, like, the bottom rung. So, for example, the end of chapter one you have successfully gotten your way onto a cruise that's headed to the next port. And you've gotten on by, like, disguising yourself as, like, a deckhand. A and yeah. it, it ends, like, there's a fade out, and the camera pulls back away from the boat as Manny is, like, swabbing the deck. And you see, like, end of Act 1. And then Act 2 begins, and Manny is the fucking captain of the boat. <laughs> because that's just the kind of guy he is. <laughs> and I, like... It's a beautiful, like, I'm not doing a great job of selling, like, why this was such a flashbulb moment, because there's not really a way to do that without spoiling a game that I really encourage anyone out here to go play. And it's usually, just a really good story. Yeah, usually I'm pretty, like, eh about spoilers for games, especially games that are as old as Grim Fandango, but, like, it is a story that is worth experiencing. They put out a remastered version of it not more than, what, four or five years ago at most. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's pretty recent from what and I remember. It, like, go play Grim Fandango. It is a beautiful game. It's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I might go play some of it after we're done recording this. <laughs> I, I do not blame you. I might grab the Steam version because I can't play the PS4 version. <laughs> yeah, no, it. go check it out. It's really good, and it's. I have not played many games since that have impacted me with their story in the same way. So that's that's what I got. What about you, Dylan? What's your what's your OG? Yeah, so the final game I want to talk about, which honestly like feels like a weak follow up to Grim Fucking Fandang <laughs> <laughs> Fandango. Nah, hit me hit me with your sweetness. Uh, I I don't really... like that those words came out of my mouth. <laughs> Let's move on. I don't know if I can anymore. <laughs> um, so the game I was going to talk about was uh Super Mario Bros. Two. Oh, yeah. Um, or Doki Doki Panic in uh, Japan. It's a long story for people who don't know. Also, like, it's not really important. Super Mario Brothers 2 was a game for the NES that I have never beaten, but I've, I've played a decent amount of it, but I've watched my dad play even more of it. So, like, this is actually when I was, like, three or four. Um, Like, these are some of my earliest memories. And I remember even at that early age, like really appreciating the the detail that went into because like when when you go from super mario bros one which is like a lot of like you know brick tiles and then like maybe in the background you'll see a hill or a tree or a cloud or something there's not really a lot of visual variety in that game but in super mario brothers 2 you know in addition to the occasional cloud as a backdrop on the sky you have a lot of really cool uh set dressing like there's these enemies that ride magic carpets, uh, the Shy Guys have, like, a lot more detail to them than the Goombas. Um, they just, the game, it feel it felt like the game had a little bit more personality, and then you have, like, these pots that, like, take you to these weird sub-dimensions. Yeah, they, they did a lot with the NES for that game. Yeah. Like, especially considering what, like, I love Super Mario Bros. 1, but the jump in visual quality from 1 to 2 is kind of staggering. <laughs> Yeah, like, Mario, Luigi, uh, Peach, and Toad, they all have, like, much more detailed sprites. You can make out some more details of uh, Mario's face in particular. Just a really visually impressive game. Uh, all of the enemies have, like, personality to their design. There's, like, the weird bird door, if you remember what I'm talking about, where, like, you'll you'll beat Birdo. Um, that's another thing. There are more bosses than just Bowser. Uh, and Which they all refreshing. have their own strategies to fighting them. And yeah, yeah, uh, you, you like beat the boss and you go through this door that is like a bird that opens its mouth and swallows you. And it's really weird and unsettling, but like in a kind of cool never ending story way. And so I think like the defining moment where I was like, oh, this is really cool was there's this moment in like the second level, I think, where you go down a pot and you have to grab a key. And there are these two masks that are there and they're just set dressing. But like you pick up the key and then one of the masks comes alive and starts chasing you. And so, you know, in a panic, you leave the pot, and you're like, okay, good, I'm safe. Except the mask follows you. 
They and there was such cool things with that game. There, there is something about that that a terrified me as a kid, but also, <laughs> b, but also b like just that that kind of continuity across game screens was like something I'd never seen before. It's and something it, it really they hadn't done before. Like, yeah, it it really got me to think about like the continuity of time in these video games, and like you know, it, it had me start thinking more about like the details and presentation. Yeah. And see, na- see, fast forward to now when some of your favorite games are like the early uh, Resident Evil games. Yeah, yeah. That did a lot of fun stuff with continuity between screens. Yeah, just like, it's cool, man. Yeah. Video no. games. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Video games are the best. Ah, man. <laughs> Tokyo, Japan. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, that's... That's really got to be my pick. Um, I feel like That's I had good maybe pick. one other thing to say about it, but like, oh no, I was I was gonna broaden that to NES games in general. Uh, usually oh, yeah. when I when I go back and like see what NES games pique my interest, it's usually the ones that have a lot of visual. For, like, I think Castlevania Three is a worse game than Castlevania One. Castlevania Three is still my favorite NES game because there's just levels that are you like going through the Transylvania countryside and like. There's just such a level of, like, variety to, like, you know, you're going through a forest, now you're going through a swamp, now you're on a pirate ship, uh, mm-hmm. now you're in a clock tower. It's just, it's really cool. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of, like, Super Mario Bros. 3 was the, mm-hmm. the Mario game I played the most, and same thing. They, they pushed the differences in feelings between the different worlds in that game real hard and mm-hmm. did some real cool stuff with it. So, I just, I'm sorry, I just, like was hurled backwards in time and i for a moment i was five years old flipping through the instruction manual for super mario bros 3 that came with the cartridge and looking at like all the different illustrations of mario in the different suits and like Mm. i just had like an out-of-body experience um (laughs) see i guess that might be another one for me um (laughs) anyway that anything else you want to you want to throw in or shall we wrap Uh, i think we should wrap yeah, so thank you all for listening. Uh, this was a little bit of a, like I said, it was kind of a self-indulgent episode, but it's kind of fun to look back at, like, what well, are the things we can, that... We can make it not a self-indulgent episode, and I know I'm kind of skipping ahead, but you should really use, use that hashtag BSGpod <laughs> and talk about... Yeah, yeah, engagement, <laughs> yeah, bitches. I, I want to <laughs> hear your flashbulb games, and I'm not, that's not a bit, like, seriously, Yeah, no, honestly, please, please do. Like, that, that... That's that's the most like YouTuber tell me in the comments below thing we've ever said on the air. But like honestly, I'm really curious if you listen and you have a moment that you can think of from like an early game you played that changed the way you look. Like please let us know. That would be awesome. And that's a great segue. You can do that using the hashtag BSG Pod as we head into all of our housekeeping at the end. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, it means the world to us that we have what audience that we do and that you enjoy listening and you come back every week if you do i guess but if you enjoy what we're doing please tell your friends about this please tell your family about this please tell your favorite restaurant wait staff person your carpenter, about this maybe your carpenter if as they repair your door um <laughs> i'm so sorry about the break-in uh, <laughs> but also uh If you enjoy what we're doing, please leave a review, leave a rating on iTunes. That will really help us out as far as growth goes. You can find us on iTunes. You can find us on Spotify, on the Google Play Store, on Stitcher, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, really. I've found us on a bunch of different podcatchers recently that I didn't even have to submit to. And as always, you can check us out at our website, bsgpod.com. We've got bios. We've got a contact form if you want to get in touch with us directly. We've got uh, all of our episodes there if you want to get us straight from the source as well. Check it out. Tell your friends. And again, I'm sorry about everything that they stole from you. The friends or the... <laughs> Who knows? Did your friends break down the door? <laughs> it was Kramer. <laughs> Jerry! Kramer. Smash. <laughs> anyway, um... Why the fuck did I just make a Seinfeld I was about to say, the year you, of our Lord you, 2019? If you want to hit us up with more Seinfeld jokes, you can check out our Facebook... <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> you should check out our Facebook, our Twitter. Our handle is at BSG underscore cast. And we also are on YouTube. And if you want to talk to us about your uh, your flashbulb games or, uh, you know, uh, Seinfeld jokes, I guess. Yeah, if you, must. you know, 
those those dank Seinfeld memes. <laughs> you know, use the hashtag at BSG pod. Also, huge, huge thanks to our friend Brennan French for the key art he has provided us with. Um, if you dig his stuff and want to check out more of him, you should visit him on Squarespace at brennan-french.squarespace.com. That is b-r-e-n-n-e-n-french.squarespace.com. Uh, you can also check him out at instagram.com slash brennanfrencharts. You should also take a look at our friend BioQuery. He is the musician behind our theme song, Dot Sound Radio Volume 1 Instrumentality. He's fantastic. He's got his own EP out right now called Posthuman Angst, which is all of his own original music. And he also has an EP out called Lynx Volume 1, which is an album that he did uh, the production for for a bunch of rappers from around the country. And it, they're both fantastic. They're really cool music. You can check him out by going to his SoundCloud, which is soundcloud.com slash bioquery. That's B-I-O-Q-U-E-R-Y. Or by searching bioquery on Spotify. Go give him a listen. And one more time, check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash bsgpod. If you like what we do and you want to help us out there, that would be hugely appreciated. If you don't, that's also totally fine. But consider sharing us, telling your friends about us. Uh, and to all of our patrons, thank you so much for your support. It means the world to us. Anything else for the good of the order, Dylan? Nah, I'm good. I right. I, I already hit him with the Seinfeld. Yep, we, we we knocked him dead with that one. We're we're yeah. real good. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for your eternal support and for listening every week. Uh, wins B movie too. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>